This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today is Peter Borish. Peter is a longtime trader, analyst, former Fed official, all kinds of experience. I'm proud to say that going back to my beginnings, I consider Peter an early mentor and a continued mentor, a guy with wisdom. He's willing to share it. He always speaks openly. Without any further delay, let's jump right into the fourth conversation I've had on this podcast with Peter Borish. I kind of always view you as, uh, with your background and everything, like a senior statesman. And you've seen a lot, a lot of cycles, a lot of generations, a lot of relationships and interesting Rolodex. So I'd like to keep you evergreen as much as I can. We'll use some of the current examples, but you've got wisdom that goes beyond whatever's happening this year, which some kid can apply five years from now. So I think that's important. I'll try and keep you there my level-headed best. Wisdom from having lost money in every imaginable way. That's the very humbling nature of this business. Yeah, absolutely. That's the teacher, right? There's no greater teacher. You can read all the books, but when you start losing it, boom. It's an interesting place to start because where are we in the cycle? Where are we in terms of the engaging of everything that's just stuff, whether that's sports betting, whether that's equities, whether that's crypto, others. To people, it's all just stuff. The cycle is always the same. When you're making money, you're really, really smart. You feel good and you do more of it on the way down. You try to trade, you do all the mistakes that you do on the way down, averaging down, trying to be smart, maybe a little bit of the gambler's mentality. And then when you lose all your money, that's the end. It takes a really long time to get back in. That's the problem with a lot of these apps. Again, whether it's gambling or trading, I separate crypto because those apps are somewhat different. The cost of customer acquisition is very high. And then when you lose that customer, it's not good. It's just like playing Texas Hold'em. The barriers to entry are very low. People are always very friendly and come on in, sit down at the table, put your ante in. The winners stay, they get bigger pots. The losers leave. That's been the nature of this business. And that's the way it was on the floor. Somebody new would come in, you'd put your arm around them. Hey, how you doing? Where are you from? What's going on? Oh, you want to sell some crude here? Okay, I'll buy it from you. You talk to them, you find out about their life. All of a sudden, crude is up a buck and you're super nice and the guy's out $10,000. And he leaves and then you're really nice to the next person. The winners stay in this business. The losers end up leaving because the barriers to entry are very low. And the way that the regulatory process has continued, both through leverage ETFs, through options, daily options, it's enabled the barriers to entry to be removed even more. Let me take this back in time a little bit. I rewatched, not in preparation for you, but I was just looking for something in the background the other day, and I rewatched The Big Short. When I watched The Big Short, I say to myself, well, well <laughs> what happened after? How did everything get fixed? But then I think to myself, I'm going to talk to Peter, and Peter knows something about perhaps... I don't know, arguably the D-Day of the Fed getting involved in things, which would be the fall of 87. Is there a connective tissue, Peter, in your mind? And you could take it back to where you want to start it, just some kind of big picture lesson. Because for me, and I've said this on the podcast a lot, it feels like there's a thread, at least for a guy that came along in the 90s. I can look at what happened after the dot-com crash. I can look at what happened after the Great Recession. I can look at what's potentially happening right now, and it feels like a thread. I was a little bit younger during the 87 time period. Do you take a connective tissue to all these events in your mind? 
I do. But I think if you're going to go back and look at be a sort of an economic historian, look at sort of the long lens of things, you have to go back further. You have to say what happened during this period of coronavirus at the end of the cycle? Where were we another period in history? Just to start off, we are not in the 70s, in my opinion. I'm afraid the generals are fighting the last war. I also think by the end of the third, fourth quarter this year, they're going to be more concerned about deflation than inflation because relative price changes, which is what we're having now, is not inflation. Let's just take a trip back in time. World War II. We fought a war. We lost a lot of people. We financed it with public debt. Bombings, of course, led to a lot of supply chain disruptions. We just fought a war against coronavirus. We financed it with public debt. We had major supply chain disruptions. We also lost, unfortunately, a lot of people. In 1944, what was Fed policy? Fed policy was to tolerate slightly higher inflation. Why? Because that reduces the real value of the public debt. It also pushes people through wage increases into higher tax bracket, which increases tax revenues, which reduce public debt. The one thing that also happened was tax rates went up significantly over the next decade. By the time Eisenhower was president, the top marginal tax rate was 92%. Of course, everybody says, oh, nobody paid that. Well, they certainly paid something a lot higher than they're paying today. So if you take that history lesson, the Fed policy was to tolerate slightly higher inflation for longer. We embarked at that point on a 38-year bear market in bonds. Interest rates went up from 1944 to 1982. Like most markets, the biggest moves happen at the end. 80 to 82 with Volcker and the changes, policy coming in and a lack of toleration. From 1982 to 2020, we had a bull market in interest rates, 38 years in symmetry. Now, if you look at bond futures since they started trading, even though it was a bull market, about 50% of the months, bond futures were down. Nothing goes straight up, nothing goes straight down. That's the hard part of trading and trends. In my mind, we are just at the tail beginning of another long cycle. In that cycle of rising rates, which will be gradually as things go, because trading is a second derivative business, it'll be faster. The one thing that's missing today, which I think may happen, during post the midterms and during the lame duck is an increase in tax rates of some sort. Now, whether that's marginal tax rates, whether that's changes to the way that they collect Social Security and Medicare, et cetera, this isn't a sort of a policy wonk podcast. I won't go into thoughts on that or even the way they do the gasoline tax. It all has implications and that history is flowing. Now you fast forward. You had a lost decade, which is what I think we're basically going to have. I don't know how far down we're going to go. You had that lost decade right from 73 to the end of 82. Essentially, the markets were unchanged. I sort of kid around for people because and then you start in 87 with Greenspan, his first cutting of rates to provide liquidity post the crash. You saw that again a decade later with LTCM. And that was sort of uh, policy and the Greenspan put. But with rates at zero, it's kind of difficult to do that. Here we are, and you can't separate the global economy. You can't separate what's going on politically, not only in the US, but around the world, whether you look at Italy or Sri Lanka or the UK. It doesn't matter whether it's Biden, who's a Democrat and perceived as liberal, or Johnson, who's a conservative and perceived as conservative, who's ever in power. I'm against it. That makes policy particularly difficult. The strength of the dollar, that's also deflationary. The policies and declining equity markets, because everything, we don't realize how leveraged we all are to a rising S&P. I'm a university. I have an endowment. I give out 5%. Oops, that's gone down, so I give out less. My donors are leveraged to the S&P, so I can't give. my Students' parents are leveraged to the S&P if they have a 529. All of that is contractionary, and it's only just beginning 
as Hemingway famously said about bankruptcy, you start gradually and then suddenly, which is like markets. If you go into your market radar and your trading aspect, big moves, whether up or down, in this case down, they happen from oversold conditions. When Netflix went down, it was already down a lot. When JP Morgan went down yesterday, it was already down a lot because people tend to say, well, I'm going to mean revert. I'm going to buy the dip. And they anchor to a prior price and go, well, it was here. It came down and it's going to go back up there or it'll go back. That's all true, but the partial way. I always say to people, never minimize the pain when looking backwards from a positive outcome. It's a very difficult environment right now because to me, we're in this transition. As I learned from my old boss, constantly saying what's obvious is obviously wrong. What's obvious to everybody is inflation. I believe that's obviously wrong. And actually, that's probably worse for the equity markets because you get squeezed. If you look at the charts of the companies that were sort of bailed out in COVID, the airlines and everything else, they're back down towards those lows. Politically, there isn't going to be any bailout. The Fed's not coming to the rescue. Fiscal policy is not coming to the rescue. In fact, if one of the two houses are turned over into Republican control in the fall, it's even more negative because nothing will happen. That's not a stake of where you are in terms of the political spectrum. Although I'm a Democrat that believes in markets, it's just that when you're this polarized, it goes back to the Groucho Marx. Whatever you're for, I'm against it. That's kind of where we are politically right now in the U.S. You're a guy that is not about to fight the tape. You've got a trading mindset, but you also have a deep understanding of the Fed. So I want the audience to understand that, that even though you can give us all a great fundamental understanding, ultimately, from a trading perspective, you're not going to fight the tape and go broke. You're going, to go, you're going to go with move. Let me get to a point that you brought up, and I'm just curious with that little setup from me, thinking back to Volcker, the rising of rates in the early 80s. Can you imagine some number, some ultimate interest rate that we get to that's going to surprise or shock people? Well, I have a good imagination just to back up. Thank you for that last line, because whatever I say on a fundamental basis and step back is great. The right to change my mind starts as soon as I put my tongue back in my mouth. What matters is discipline and risk management. I have a piece of a GP of a natural gas trading fund called Torsion. Let me tell you, natural gas is crazy. It's the commodity that's more volatile than anything else. It's more volatile actually than anything but individual equities. You have a view. If you don't have discipline around that view, you can go out of business in a heartbeat. So this thing has had a round trip, went up to nine, came down to five and a half. I mean, from five and a half, it's completely crazy. So yeah, I can talk about everything, but when it comes to trading, what matters is risk management, discipline, and P&L. We can sit around and talk about these other things in terms of perspective, which is important in the back of your mind. The day-to-day -day is all about living for the next day. By discipline, you mean a set of rules. A set of rules to realize when you are wrong. You can do all the work you want to do, and you can come in in 10 minutes after the open, all that work. You just wasted your whole weekend doing research and work and coming up with a game plan because the market is right and you are wrong. The human condition is to try to make all the excuses in the world as to why you are right and the market is wrong. Who first told you that the market is right? I mean, you obviously learned a lot of things along the way, but was there the early mentor that where you really took in that understanding? It's like, look, the market is right is a very simple statement. I mean, it's extremely simple. If you went on CNBC and you said that today, I suspect the vast majority of people would not get the depth or nuance of that. When I started my career, I was lucky. I went to Michigan undergraduate graduate school. I was fortunate enough to get a job at the Fed in research and covering futures and options. And there, you sort of think you're right. Then I was had the 
pleasure of working with Paul Jones and he brought me in there and he's the one that taught me and said, it doesn't matter because you have to live to fight another day. Probe, if you're wrong, get out. If you get in and it goes your way, you're going to make it all back and then some. It's the compounding of the loss. If you follow me on Twitter or whatever, and I said, averaging down works great until the one time when it doesn't work and then you're out of business. Now you can't make your money back if you're out of business. So you have to have that discipline to stay in business. If you think about, again, this notion of deflation, what's different between now and the 70s, where are gold and silver today? They haven't rallied. They're selling off all the time. That's important to listen to the market. What is that? With supply and demand dynamic, whether unfortunately it's the war in Ukraine, which led to right now a very short-term rally in wheat, which has come back, or corn, soybeans, or crude oil. But I sit back as a market analyst technician and I go, wait a second, crude never took out the high 08 under President Bush. Is this just a secondary test of the old high? Now it's going to go back down into sort of its historical range, 60 to 75 from where we are in the upper 90s. I don't know because it's very volatile and it's an expensive futures contract. You can pull out a few dollars and have success. That's a major divergence. If you're a trader, you're like, wait, okay, our Bob gasoline made new highs. Crew didn't make new highs. That's got to be a warning flag. Every time you see one of those things, it has to be a warning flag. Let's take this podcast right now today. Yesterday, the Dow Jones Transports made new lows for the move. Took out its June lows. The Dow did not. To me, that's a short run divergence. I'm saying to myself, okay, I think it's expiration today. It's Friday, July 15th. Between now and the end of the month, we could have a rally in the S&P. So that's where my mindset is. Then I go, all right, the worst thing for me, I think we're going lower very much so into the fall. There's going to be rallies. Try to sell rallies. The worst thing I could do if you're a discretionary trader is buy a market which you think is going down because you're playing it for a bounce. So if you lose that, that just drives you crazy. You bought something, you were negative, it messes with your head and then you've lost money. Are you likely to sell it down in the hole? Because you sort of, again, you lost your game plan, you lost your discipline. Right here, I have nothing on. I anticipate I could be wrong. Now we have these parameters. If we make new lows, you could sell it. If we get up to the levels that I think we could potentially get to by the end of the month, early August, then I'm there. Then you go back to your history and you go, okay, August has an interesting month of inflection points. Let's go back. In 87, what month was the high? August. In 98, what month was the high? August. You're like, okay, I'm going to sort of keep that in the back of my mind. Coincidence? Maybe. People will say, oh, that's just a coincidence. But on the other hand, they'll look at the two periods where the first half of the year was down 20% or more or whatever, and then go, oh, the second half of the year, those two times, the market was up. That must be bullish. You have to be very careful of having selective bias in the data you want to do, which just confirms what you want to believe. It goes back to what I said about people being triple leveraged to the equity market. Everybody wants it to rally. My concern is the Fed raises 75 or 100 basis points. That might be the catalyst for that last bit of the rally to get there and saying, okay, they're done. I kind of took you off on a side tangent there. Let me bring it back to rates in terms of You mentioned a lost decade example, and I thought you were imagining what we might be facing in the next 10 years or whatnot. Speak to where, back to my original question, where you could imagine rates could go. I mean, could we get back to a situation where we actually have interest rates again after not having them for so long? Yes. You don't have to have that vivid of an imagination like I have. You just have to step back and say, wait a second. This notion, and we saw that again this year, rates going up with the stock market going down. Oh, no, that doesn't happen. Why could rates go up in the U.S.? Why could they go up faster? Because it's a perceived lack of confidence. 
in what's happening in our fiscal monetary policy. One thing that I do on a regular basis, so I have three legs in my work stool. The first one is uh, this natural gas. The second one is I consult with the senior people at CIBC on global macro strategy about a lot of these things. The head of the capital markets up there, Christian, is so smart and insightful because he's got these team of people and we talk about this all the time. I say two things. One, if you can think about it, it's not a black swan. Everybody's like, oh, I got to think about what this black swan is. I'm like, if you can think about it, that's risk management. You should do scenarios about that. So whether that's the war escalates, whether that the economy slows, those are all risk management things. A black swan is when you go to sleep and you wake up the next morning and Abe is assassinated. That wasn't in anybody's risk models. Unfortunately, that's a black swan. Now, let's think about this. We risk manage and we talk about interest rates and you say to yourself, okay, there's a lack of confidence in the U.S. Why? Well, because I'm wrong. There is no fiscal policy in terms of raising revenues to reduce the public debt. There's actually going to be zero fiscal stimulus if there's a split Congress. I think we can agree on that. And thirdly, the composition of government spending, which is going more into defense spending and less into discretionary, is a smaller multiplier effect. If you build a bunch of bullets, manufacture them and store them in Denmark, that's not going through the economy. There's a multiplier, but it's not the same size as if it goes through. You're building a highway and you're hiring people and you're working and that increases economic efficiency and so forth and so on. That's another interesting implication. Where can interest rates go? So there's a lack of confidence. We have this massive debt. We have to redo it. Our interest rates are already up from the low of 20. And this is where people tend to be surprised. Look at what our 30 year interest rates are already up a few hundred percent from that low. If you have to refinance, what does that do for government spending? That takes away. So it's a bit contractionary. So rates could go up a lot more because non US purchasers of US treasuries haven't done that. The banks have purchased a lot of treasuries for their balance sheet, but they're already stuffed with them. Then you look at the geopolitical aspect. You look at Chinese foreign holdings and U.S. Treasury, those are down. I keep trying to explain to people, you can't separate the economic from the political or from the policy. They all weave together. If you just go, well, I'm going to look at this individual company, that's okay in the very short run. But over time, you have to look at these other variables that play into that. Yes, interest rates can be far higher than other people think. And that, to me, is a major concern, again, that people are not implementing into their risk models. If that's the case, when I sit there and we scenario play with the CIBC, it's all about where is the leverage in the system? That's what happens. Take this simple example. You're a rich guy. I wish I was like you, Mike. Well, I really do. I'm a poor guy living on a pension somewhere in Asia. <laughs> okay, all right, Heinemroff. Got to get our Godfather analogy in there always. I've watched the Godfather in the last two weeks, so. <laughs> hey, I tell everybody that's one of the, if you're going to manage people, that's one of the mandatory movies. Godfather 1 and 2, Outlaw Josie Wales. And of course, people tend to forget you have to watch The Lion King because the first line of The Lion King is, Life's not fair. If you start from that perspective, then you won't feel sorry for yourself. When you scenario play, you look at leverage. So I go back to you and I'm like, okay, you're a rich guy. You got a million dollars worth of Apple. You don't want to sell it because you don't want to pay taxes. You're like, go to your bank and the bank goes, oh, Apple's a pretty stable stock. I'll lend you 300 grand against it. Look at the rates. They're pretty low. You're like, wow, what a great deal. And then you go and you buy it and you go, shit, man, I have missed out on this whole Bitcoin thing. I'm going to go into Bitcoin and I'm not going to go crazy. I'm just going to lever it two to one. You get in at 50, it goes down to 25, you're wiped out. Two to one leverage, you're there. Apple goes down 30% and the bank calls you up, goes, hey, you got to go make this margin call because your leverage ratio is now out of whack. And you're like, I don't have any cash. And the bank goes, well, we're protected. 
I'm going to sell your apple. And guess what? Then you still have to go pay taxes. Now you're in a much worse situation. It's a simple example of where leverage comes in and the deleveraging and the unwind. We don't know where all that is. I always use, because I'm a New Yorker, I don't have any patience. I go up a state and I'm supposed to go fishing with a friend and we're on a lake. I'm like, I'm not going to throw a rod in the water there. I'm going to go take a stick of dynamite. I'm going to go toss it in the lake. And boom, what pops up to the surface? A bunch of smaller fish. We take a net, we clean it up, and we think we're pretty good. We go away. Well, a couple of weeks later, what pops up? A bigger fish. Why? Because, well, it fed off the smaller fish. The stick of dynamite upset the balance for breathing and other small animals under there that they lived on. Then you clean that up. And then later on, it's the really big fish that pops up. Seems to me where we are in that process, whether that was Archigo or Green Hill, or those were sort of the smaller fish that were swept away. Now some of the bigger fish are popping up. To me, this is where my timing is somewhere at the end of the summer, the fall, that's going to be a bigger fish and a really big fish. I don't know what it is, but that's where my risk management is. That's where my mentality is. That's the delevering. That's where we are in this environment. And that's why I'm constantly saying it's deflationary. It's not inflationary. If you have inelastic demand for a product, take it this way. I got to drive to a job. I'm spending more on gasoline or I have to feed my kids. Am I going to pay my rent? What goes first? Am I going to pay my electric bill? This is substitution. And then I worry about it because the difference between now and the 70s, in the 70s, we had an oil price shock and the Fed decided, well, oil prices are up. We're going to flood the system with money to raise all the other relative prices to make the shock less. That didn't work. That led to inflation. If you go back to Milton Friedman and he says, well, inflation is always a monetary phenomena. How can you have inflation in a period where the Fed is tightening and fiscal policy is tightening, where we have this long period of fiscal monetary easing, both through increased spending, through tax cuts, through rate cuts? That didn't lead to significant inflation. Short run supply and demand dynamics, which change price levels, is non inflationary. And my concern is that the generals are fighting the last war. I think it's great that you give that kind of scenario analysis thinking because I look at the headlines and it seems like every day for a month, I don't have any crypto investments, so to speak, at the moment. It seems like every day for a month, another crypto exchange or another crypto bank is said, oh, sorry, you can't access your accounts. Sorry, we're gone. Poof. It's like the old South Park clip that runs around on the internet. I mean, when the banks start closing the doors and saying you can't have your money, that seems like a red flag, huh? Yes, deflationary. But let's go back to the time we first chatted when we were both younger. I still had completely blonde hair. I said to you, price makes news, not the other way around. The price of crude has been making news. The walking billboard, it's the only billboard we have of prices everybody sees all the time, which is the outside of a gasoline station. So they see those prices going up. They're like, oh, that has to be inflation. It's not. If we look at the crypto, we look at technology, we look at blockchain. I'm going to say that I believe in that technology. I also believe that where there's low barriers to entry with anything that's new, people are going to come in You're going to have excess capacity. That can be radio stations and automobiles in the 20s. That can be computers in the 80s. Literally, Paul and I, we were on our hands and knees on the weekend, taking apart PCs, pulling out floppy drives, putting in hard drives. We were data hungry capacity. And we're like, oh, this is going to change the world. We bought every public company that was available. And they all went out of business. Of course, that's when Apple started, and that's when Microsoft started. And I think to myself, okay, Apple starts, whatever, the mid-80s. It takes 30 years for it to go from a million-dollar valuation to a trillion-dollar valuation. And then it takes a few years to go to $2 trillion, then to 
almost three trillion. Markets make their big moves at the end. They don't make the big moves at the beginning. Same thing with Amazon. Look at Microsoft. Microsoft started and IBM gave Bill Gates like, well, we're in the hardware business. We're not in the software business. You can run the software business. And of course, the same thing with the internet in the 90s. We knew it was going to change the world. Thank goodness for Global Crossing for laying all that cable and making the world a smaller place. But they went out of business. That's where we are in the crypto blockchain evolution. A lot of tremendous innovation, too much money, too fast. You want to be the guy that's buying Amazon when it goes from 5 to 10, not when it's going from 20 to 10. I'll add something. You brought up that quote, price makes news, not the other way around. And I put that in my trend following book in 2004. Now, the first time that we met was 1994. Then you gave me, you were very kind. You gave me a lot of your time over a couple year period, several meetings and stuff. And I kind of stalked you a little bit. I don't think people understand the process necessarily in this sense. And I'm kind of going on a divergent path here. If you want to meet somebody out there who's had some success, who's done something. I mean, I'm not saying everybody needs to go find their way to Peter's door tomorrow. There's other people. There's all kinds of people on this planet. I learned that lesson. You were one of the first people that I had a chance to get exposed to in this industry. And again, you're very kind to just share information with me. Then we didn't connect for like four or five, six years. Then the trend following book came out in 2004. And somehow or another, we connected an email we ended up having a lunch, I think, at the old Ebbett Grill. And you walked in, you're like, you're the guy that wrote the book. And we realized we had not seen each other for a significant amount of time. But I just share that story because sometimes people don't realize that a lot of people that have got there and have made big jumps of success, they want to give back and they'll talk to you. And you talk to me. And I always feel lucky about that. First of all, I think it goes to a lot of credit. We at Tudor, we had early success, and sometimes there's a sense of arrogance, but we know this is a humbling business. And so you better be nice to everybody because you don't know when the next one lot trader is going to be the next thousand lot trader. If you're not nice to that one lot person, they're going to remember that. You may never remember them. You may never even recall having that conversation. Then when they're that size and you want to recruit them or you want to work with them or you want their advice because they've really been successful, they're going to be like, wait a second. Where were you when I needed you? For me, I don't do it because I think I'm a nice guy. I do it because I'm a pure markets guy. And I think it's enlightened self-interest on my part because I don't know. When you wrote that book, it highlighted Salem and Jerry to a large extent. And these are two of my close friends and really great people. I was so happy for them. It demonstrated what they were doing in their data analysis and their discipline towards the markets. And the way that you wrote it was actually readable, not so dry that you're like, oh, okay, I'll wait for the video, which was back then. That was pre-CD and now you just wait for it on, on YouTube. That was part of the connection. That's how I feel. I like people that are interested in learning. I'm a markets guy, as I said. My door is always open for the right price. I think back to myself, like, I mean, I was a guy that was in the suburban DC area, not exposed to markets or Wall Street at all. But all I said to myself was, and it was probably partly inspired from Jerry's story, that if Jerry could, not taking anything away from Jerry, but if Jerry could learn it from somebody, that somebody happened to be a pretty successful guy. But if Jerry could learn from somebody, my thought was, well, why can't I learn from somebody? Even though I had no background, I was like, well, let me go find some of those somebodies. And that was the logic. Yeah, well, everything's done at, I'm an economist, it's all done at the margin. You sit down in your first university class and they give you this syllabus, this is what you're going to learn over the course of a semester. And you're completely overwhelmed because you're like, well, I don't know any of this and it's not really that much of a time. A good professor breaks it down into small, digestible components, and day by day, it builds up. And that's why it's called a final. You don't take a beginning, you take a final. That's unfortunately the way it is in the markets, except there is no grade. It doesn't matter 
how much you think you know, and in fact, it can be counterproductive. The more you think you know, maybe you're going to lose your discipline. You're like, well, okay, I know I should get out, but it's Friday, it's expiration day, it's light, it's the summer. You can talk yourself out of anything to keep on a position that's a loser. That leads to a very negative spiral. In your scenario analysis thinking, I'll see if you're willing to play along with me. I want to go back in time to two events that we've already talked about. The 87 crash, October, and LTCM, summer 98. Both of those events, the Fed showed up and played ball. You could pick either one or talk about both. What would have happened, for example, though, if the Fed did not do what they did in the summer of 98? Would we have been better off in the long run if the Fed did not step up and do what they did with LTCM? Let's go back to 98. We must discuss at the same time there was tremendous political uncertainty going on in Russia at the same time, which further or exacerbated the type of moves. And in 87 and in 98, of course, the Fed came in after there was already a major decline or correction, not only in the equity markets, but movement elsewhere. To say that, well, would we be better off? It's kind of hard to say that because we're pretty damn well off where we came. Post-87, the market stabilized. That's when we started the uh, Robin Hood Foundation here in New York City because we felt that was going to lead to some economic contraction and the city that we loved would be hurt. Well, fortunately, when COVID started and 30 plus years later, we were in a good position to help. So we get around and said, well, maybe we started it 30 years early. That's the way it is, right? If you just hold on for the long run, you'll be okay. That's the story of the market. Same in 98. Where we've gone from the level of economic growth, the level of economic integration, my concern is that after 87, then in 89, when the Berlin Wall came down, that ushered in a generation of the free flow of capital, ideas, people. That led to tremendous economic growth. Remember the peace dividend that put in. And so, yeah, again, at the early stages, we were there, went too far, LTCM. Where was it? Same problem I was just talking about. Too much embedded leverage without fully understanding it. The Fed sees that, they stabilize it. My biggest concern now is that we're unwinding that period from 89, and that generation or two is over. Now we're not having the free flow of capital, people, and ideas. We're not having a peace dividend. As I said earlier, we're spending more on defense, which has less of a multiplier. That's kind of my point, though. You talk about we're unwinding that period. So in your mind, different perspective, but are you taking it back to that point in time? Because look, you've been pretty bearish. You've laid out a pretty bearish scenario. You haven't said any kind of area where you think the S&P could drop to. Why could I not imagine the S&P going down 50% like it did in 08, 09 or 2000, 2002? We could be facing a situation, boom, bust period in 22 years, three of them minus 50% on the S&P. I guess that was my bringing up 87 in the Fed, my bringing up 98 in LTCM and the Fed's response. And here we are having this scenario analysis conversation. I just wonder if all the boom busts in the long run are going to end up having been worth it. It's a great question. We can leave that for the historians in terms of after the fact. It's like after the fact, everything is obvious. Nobody can explain yesterday better than me. That doesn't help make money for today or tomorrow in an uncertain world. That's part of the problem with most forecasts is they assume a scenario that's going to be consistent. I happen to love that because I ask everybody, I'm like, hey, you think I look any older today than I did yesterday? They go, no. I go, you think I'm going to look any older tomorrow than I did today? And they go, no. And I go, great. I guess I'm never going to get old. That's good for the ego, but that's sort of economic analysis. Well, you know, the S&Ps did this and this did that. And so if you just draw a line, we know that they're going to come back. Now you talk about a 50% decline. Well, we're already halfway there. If we do go there, that just takes us back to where we were at the low of 2020, which 
the last I checked my calendar is only two years ago. When I ask people, I go, was the last half of 21 crazy or was the first half of 22 crazy? Of course, it's never crazy when things are going up. It's only crazy when they're going down, whether we've normalized that. Now, if the Fed is trying to get back to a normalized policy, so where is that? Is it four, four and a half on the 10-year? Maybe. Do we overshoot? Okay, yeah. We could overshoot, and by the end of 23, we could be at five or higher. Not significantly higher, but historically, that's still a pretty damn good 10-year rate. If we have complete policy paralysis, if we have a continued division between red states and blue states and what that means for younger workers and going there, I have a friend whose daughter worked at Goldman Sachs and they're like, uh, okay, we're going to move to some to Nashville or some to Miami. She's like, I quit. I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, I've worked here for two years. I went to MIT. I think I can get another job. I have no interest in going down to any of those places. It's not so easy to pick up and move. All these states where they're going to have to think through the problems. Well, we love people to come down. We don't have income taxes. Okay. You get people in there. You need new schools. You need new firemen. You need new policemen. You need new teachers. You need new roads. You need new. How are you going to pay for that? Well, we'll raise property. You're going to raise property taxes. People who've been there a while, there's going to be that other conflict. I think you're going back to the uh, Milton Friedman analogy on monetary policy. I believe he said there is no free lunch. And I think that's where people have to think that through. So in the short run, if I'm a cynic and you're like, okay, well, I'm a governor of this state or that state, all I want to do is make sure that I get through re-election and then I'll worry about all these policy problems. Is there a futures contract yet where we can bet on the continued divergence between the division, the pulling apart of red and blue states? Because I want to bet everything on that. Well, I don't know if it's on predicted or some of these other things, but yes, you already started partially made that choice by moving out of the United States. One of the questions that one has to ask is if it gets more serious from a risk management point of view, should I have some basically a backup? Do I think about moving elsewhere? Do I think about getting more liquid instead of owning renting? I mean, these are all individual risk management questions that people have to ask. The U.S., which was constitution since 1787, it's for a democracy, it's around a long time. The vision, as you say, is probably going to get wider. Why? Well, you've got a very conservative Supreme Court where four of the justices were appointed by presidents, or maybe it's five, that didn't win the popular vote. Doesn't sound fair. Hold on, you just said life wasn't fair. Correct. There is this notion of faux fairness here in the U.S. That's our tax policy. Why is it that somebody who makes 500000 is paying the same tax rate as somebody who's making $5 million, or the $5 million is paying the same tax rate as somebody who's making $50 million? Who's paying the same tax rate as five hundred million? It's probably not fair, but we have this policy of faux fairness. The counter that people might bring at you, though, they might say, "Well, okay, conceptually, I'm with you, Peter." But then they might say, "Well, gosh, once the money gets to the state and federal government, then what do they do with it?" And I think people maybe lose some faith there. They don't really see the results they might want, and maybe they just imagine that a lot of the money just becomes transfer payments to somewhere. That's a whole other question, which I think I don't want to get too deep into. But yeah, people always look at the something of inefficiency that they don't like. Do you complain about that with your cable company whose service goes out? You're out of offline, but they don't pay you back your monthly fee for what you've been out. Or the electric company that didn't build capacity and now they're just constantly raising rates. It's an easy choice because people harp on that the whole time. If you look at our infrastructure of where you are, all you have to do is drive anywhere, whether you're driving outside of New York or outside of Washington, D.C., those projects have not nearly kept pace with population growth. There's a lot of issues about that. It's the same thing. If you look at the capacity of our universities 
they've barely gone up in terms of their supply of number of seats relative to population growth. So no wonder why those university prices have gone up. You have more demand and slightly less supply. Economics works, supply and demand. All these things weave together into, I think, a realistic mosaic of what's happening in the markets itself, and it can't be separated from public policy. As we wind down, let me see if I can pick your mind for some book titles. Not mine. I'm not pushing for any, for you to say anything nice about my stuff. I'm curious, books, and I don't care uh, what they are, what topic, and I know you're a voracious reader. Uh, some of the more interesting titles I've over the years I've seen on your bookcase and I would go and try and find things that I'd never heard of. Are there some titles that you might want to give to people out there right now that really either early on inspirations to you or inspirations now, things that have shaped you? You're a pretty pragmatic guy, a nice guy, insightful, look at things deeply, but what has shaped you? What kind of reading has shaped you that you might want to share? I always say I'm a big basketball fan, and if I was going to write my own autobiography, I call it a round and out, <laughs> the story of my life. Because in this business, you always think that the shot you take in the markets is going to go in, and most times it doesn't. I think that the main thing here, it's human nature. I get some email and a guy says, hey, I've got a 57 or 87% success rate in trading to Swiss franc. Now, I've been in this business a long time. I'm like, okay, what does this guy know that I don't know? Most likely it's BS. That's human nature. I think that any book that you read, and the reason that Jesse Livermore's book, Reminiscence, has lasted sort of the longest in mandatory reading is because of what happened to him. He didn't end up following sort of his own rules. Then he committed suicide, and it's the legend of trading. Modesty and humbleness is what success leads. Young guys have all the moves, but old guys win championships. If you see in the case of these, every time there's new markets, and I'm sure I was the same way, I guarantee you that I was after the 87 crash and going into this and having a lot of success, I'm sure that I was a, a hole about, well, I know everything. The one thing that this cycle, and what I said at the very beginning of, losing money in every imaginable way, that's another title. Until you do that, you can't be successful because luck is just that. It's another four-letter word. I got to tell you, though, I know you'll kill me. You always want to kill me, but time passes on. You're still a star in one of the most famous documentaries that almost no one's seen. It's still fabulous. It's still the bomb. Thank you for that. <laughs> I think it took a long time you know, where it was and when it was and not necessarily as politically correct as it should have been in the late 80s. It demonstrates today what we did back then. We were early practitioners of data, computing power, and research. That applies today. So people that we hired, summer interns, to go to the libraries, to get out books, to type all this data in, to do our research, or for me to build that model, you can pull that all down off of Fred or other databases in hundreds of a second. Innovators each time are going to be laughed at because they're like, well, this doesn't make any sense. That's sort of where the VC world is. Just to finish up, that's the third leg of my stool, right? I try to be advisors to some VC funds or go on the boards of some companies knowing that the failure rate is very, very high. The energy that I receive and the insight from those who are a generation or a generation and a half younger is invaluable to me. As I said, I'm doing this for me as enlightened self-interest. They may think that I'm helping them and providing advice and relationships and contacts and insights over the course of many cycles. The reality is their energy level is infectious. You need a team with all these elements to be successful. You need the young guys, you need people with some experience, and you need the older people who've been there with some wisdom. And I try to surround myself with all of them. The audience can't see you right now, but you've been kind of in a twisted position because of a small basketball injury. Achilles, right? Yeah, I ruptured my Achilles, but I figured if Clay can do it and KD can do it and 
come back. Yeah, that's one of the things about aging is you lose your hops. I used to never was able to stuff it. When I was younger, I could grab onto the rim and then it slowly goes down. Now I just measure my hops by how many sheets of paper I can get over. I was doing some crazy jumping on boxes the other day with a 20-something trainer. I'm thinking, well, is this smart over the age of 50? But you're kind of like, okay, I'm doing it. Hopefully I can survive without an ACL or an Achilles. But I think we all know how this goes. As a catcher, as you once were, right? You had to be able to get out of that crouch fast and do it. Those hamstrings and quads, they're important. I got to tell you, the that's the Asian squat. Like I had no earthly idea as a 10-year-old kid, as a baseball catcher, that that position is one of the healthiest, most flexible positions to possibly be in to benefit me nearly 40 years later. Crazy. Well, that goes back, right? We learn from experience. Hey, where can we send people? Where, If you want to come check you out, the firm, is there any place you want to direct people to? Twitter, they can find you on Twitter. They can find me on Twitter. They can find me on LinkedIn. Our natural gas fund, of course, is a 4-7. It only has managed accounts. We just started this. It's a former partner from Millennium, a former head of commodities from RBC. We started in December of last year with $5 million. We're fortunate that we're a little over $50 million today, and we have people interested, and knock on wood, we'll be at $100 million, because then it's a real business. We bought in a very good team. As I say, I don't know anything, but I know a lot of people. Hopefully, if they're smart and you surround them, that some of it will rub off on me. I would say Twitter, LinkedIn, I don't tweet that much. Just to say that I tweeted last week, which was something that I talked about at the very beginning of the cycle. I said, everybody, you talk about the three R's. I watched the six C's, crude, cotton, corn, coffee, cocoa. What's the other shoe? I've got to remember the copper. There we go. At the beginning of the cycle, they were starting to take off. And then last week, a lot of them broke down. So that to me is the leading indicator, again, potentially of deflation, particularly cotton, very internationally traded, Dr. Copper, which has declined significantly. We can't forget that two things. The internet's the greatest deflationary machine ever built. It eliminates price discrimination, brings multiple transparencies across market. Two, technology enhances productivity across the spectrum, including the agricultural spectrum. Real prices have declined over time. That is to be expected. That's the trend. And you can have these off trends, which we had through supply disruption. So when you have a case where it's very easy, supply is relatively inelastic, demand is relatively inelastic, you shift one or the other, then you can have big price moves. In this case, if you have a supply shock and then it goes away, you come back down towards equilibrium, which is where I think we are in a lot of those markets not inflationary. I think the most one of the most interesting things you've said today, though, is to get people remembering that if you think you're watching the screen day by day by day or watching uh, CNBC or Bloomberg and you expect to watch the black swan unfolding in a nice linear path, that's not a black swan. So it's a good reminder for everyone to realize that what you're talking about is the proverbial shit hitting the fan coming out of nowhere. That's not hit us really yet. No, no. Usually they're not positive. So when you go to bed and you wake up in the morning and a condo in Florida has collapsed, that's a black swan. It tends to be more on the tragic side. Sir, I've kept you. Thanks for your time today. I was writing down, I was thinking, when did we talk? We talked in on the podcast, 2013, 2017, 2019, and today. So four times, time flies. I'll eventually get it right. <laughs> Peter, you have a good one. All right, thank you. You too. Have a good weekend. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. 
But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.